thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, my name is Peyton Greenside. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CSO of Big Cat Biosciences. And I'm going to tell you today about our work on trying to make it radically easier to uh, design and engineer next generation antibodies. Um, so as most of you well know, um, MAMs have probably been the, the biggest sellers and winners in the sort of antibody therapeutic space, but they have um, quite a few limitations, um, um, not uh, the least of which is they typically just bind one target. Um, there are still some undruggable targets for this format. And um, this has caused a, a set of human designed next generation antibodies um, to become breakthrough therapeutics today. And, and this is really where um, Big Hat focuses its attention. So um, in these formats, you have VHHs and antibodies, uh, these single domain antibodies um, and SCFEs. Um, these have gotten their first FDA approval in 2019. Um, we have bytes, uh, multi-specifics of, of different formats as well as conjugates and other formats. And um, these have tons of potential, particularly to um, overcome some of the limitations of MABs, um, but ultimately come with a series, a host of challenges that make them um, more difficult to, to bring forward um, through preclinical and cl uh, clinical development. So whereas MABs are typically quite well behaved in terms of affinity, function, um, stability, and solubility, um, these next generation antibodies, because they're human designed, often have a lot of biophysical challenges. So they may have suffer from lower stability, lower yield, and even though they have may potential, may have great potential for additional uh, applications where uh, MABs do not, they really have uh, these extra challenges, which make them uh, less likely to proceed through later stage development um, without further modification. So at Big Hat, we are focusing on trying to make these complex formats um, extremely easy to engineer, to basically release the, and capture the, the full potential of these next, set, next generation um, set of formats. And so we do that through an AI-guided antibody design platform that has really two key components. Um, the first is a high-speed wet lab, and emphasis especially in this session on high-speed, trying to go as quickly as possible from an uh, in-silico design through full antibody characterization, um, as well as, and this is really where um, Big Hat puts a lot of its attention, uh, machine learning methods to help guide the design process. I think we have the philosophy that often the molecule will not be per perfect, especially when it comes to, to next generation antibodies in the beginning. And what's really critical is being able to propose uh, mutations and in rapid succession, be able to learn how to guide uh, the design process towards an effective molecule. And um, with these components, um, we are able to uh, design the many properties necessary to make these next generation antibodies successful. So taking antibodies that have a lot of biophysical warts and, and allowing um, or engineering them for uh, improved functions, stability, solubility, et cetera. And we really treat these molecules as opposed to just the property of binding um, as kind of holistic molecules that have many properties um, that need to be engineered. Um, and this is one area where machine learning particularly has a big advantage where you really want to model the relationship between um, sequence and structure with multiple properties of interest. And it, it can be often difficult for, for a person to conceive of uh, the many ways those different attributes are related. So um, the, the broad overview of the platform has two phases, one of which is uh, machine learning guided design, and then a big hat work cell or the experimental component, which takes those designs and tries to synthesize and characterize the full battery of assays, of everything you would want to know uh, as much as you can in a matter of days. Obviously, animal studies, I think, are, are uh, not going to fit in just a few days, but a full battery of assays that tell you how, how well the molecule is performing um, biophysically and functionally. So um, given a, a, a design um, sort of in the bottom center, it goes through the work cell, gets the full data matrix of how that sequence is performing um, through a set of biophysical and functional characteristics. Um, we maintain um, uh, sort of, a, I would say, a constant set of models that fall into um, two categories, one of which is the assay model, uh, one of which is the design model. And I'll talk a bit more about those, but um, you can think of the assay model as how do we model properties that we care about from sequence? So we know that if we make a modification, you know that will, how that will affect a property of interest. And the second component is the uh, is design model, which is um, one of our uh, core areas of expertise, which says given the huge combinatorial space we could explore, and given how well we can model from sequence to a property of interest, how do we effectively explore the space of other mutations? And particularly in the case of next-gens, next-gen antibodies, when you may need to propose multiple mutations and not just sort of one or two, but mutations that are five uh, or 10 away from the initial starting molecule, how do you effectively design the space to, to trace that path towards a better molecule? So the um, uh, experimental portion of the Big Hat um, platform, the Big Hat work cell, essentially is trying to drive this, this design build test cycle to be uh, truly as fast as possible. Um, and so we try to go end to end from in silico designs through antibody characterization um, in days. And this is really where we put a lot of effort into trying to make this as quick as possible so that if you get a hypothesis on how you want to engineer a molecule, you can realize um, whether that is actually improved, not improved, what actually happened or the consequences of that mutation um, as quickly as possible that allows, uh, you know, 
fast iteration and, and given that iteration, very broad exploration of new sequence space. So from then silico design, um, after DNA synthesis, we use cell-free protein synthesis technologies to be able to produce our antibodies um, uh, in a matter of hours. And then we focus on trying to, as I mentioned, onboard as many assays as possible that uh, give us an indication of how well the antibody is performing. And all this is essentially captured into our, our custom limb system. One of the things that we care very deeply about is, is um, kind of reliability and assessment of how well the, the platform is actually um, performing. And, and that, um, what I mean is if you are proposing a single mutation to an antibody, and you're trying to, for example, see if you're going to improve the yield. Actually, you know, the, the variance of your experimental process may actually give the, the impression, right, that the yield is actually higher or less, but really it's variability. So we, we pay a lot of attention in terms of making this a, as well engineered of a process as possible. And as I mentioned before, there are two key machine learning components, which I can um, talk more about later, but really they fall into, into two areas. Um, this assay model, which I described, which models critical biophysical properties as well as function um, from the sequence and from structural features. And uh, you know, interestingly, you know, we, have, we have the philosophy, despite the fact that we love machine learning, that you know, no model will ever be perfect. I think this is you know, um, one of the reasons why we focus actually first on, on building uh, our lab, because despite the fact that models can grow smarter over time, you're always gonna to wanna to validate your prediction. And so this is why we spend a lot of the effort as, as the company um, started in, in making um, sort of the lab as uh, efficient uh, as possible and high throughput as possible. So that as, as we improve models and learn where their um, weaknesses and strengths are, we can, we can validate our predictions as quickly as possible. But the goal here is to basically take an unknown sequence when you propose a mutation and know how will that affect not just you know, affinity, but also stability, aggregation, propensity, yield, uh, et cetera. And then the design models I mentioned are trying to solve the problem of how you explore very complex sequence links. And so we've, you know, through um, uh, many pr prior projects, developed a series of models that try to say, well, you know, if I only have in traditional setting, maybe a few rounds of engineering where I can only propose a few mutations and that's, you know, gonna take me um, quite a while, uh, many weeks, if not months to, to characterize. If I now can iterate very quickly, proposes, uh, you know, 100 mutations um, per week, if not more, um, and, and iterate every single week. Now I can actually explore quite complex sequence space, which might have not have been accessible to me if the process took much longer. We try to lower the barrier, right, of exploring uh, potentially highly promising but highly uncertain space. And so what you see here in, in the figure in the bottom right uh, is an example of some of the methods we've developed that over many rounds or batches of designs, batches of 100 sequences we design, um, how we're actually able to um, discover sequences with um, highly improved properties, whereas uh, when, when we're able to feed the data we learned back into the models, where it's sort of the random um, mutagenesis as well as the fixed oracle, which essentially means you have a trained model, but that's not being updated every round. That's sort of learned on a fixed data set and does not change. You can rapidly um, improve the number of high-performing molecules that you see. So an uh, in, in illustration of how our, our platform really works, it's really quite simple. You have a hit antibody sequence. This can be discovered by us, discovered by someone else uh, through display, through immunization, et cetera. We have pure target protein and we have a set of quantitative design goals. Um, and again, these are multi-objective and this is really where we focus on the many, many needs of, of an antibody that um, allow it to move forward in development. And so we will iterate on the platform. We'll onboard the sequence, the targets, the platform, and iterate and iterate, uh, proposing mutations um, to be able to achieve those design goals. And, and we really just cycle and cycle and explore space until we're able to propose a series of mutations um, that lead us to our design goals. And at that point, um, we sort of finalize the lead and, and, and measure sort of the final properties. And this is a very, very simple, but um, hopefully effective representation of how our, our platform works. And it all it comes down to very rapid iteration um, um, to be able to test these hypotheses quite quickly. So I wanted to give a sense of some case studies of how we've been able to use a platform and apply the platform towards um, all sorts of actually different problems of interest, not just actually in antibodies, but in, in other um, therapeutic proteins, um, uh, because the platform can be generally applied to really uh, any such sequence. So in this case, I'll show you how um, we were able to use our platform to affinity optimize a partner um, antibody from a single sequence. Uh, in this case, we had an antibody, um, and the goal was to improve the affinity while maintaining the thermal stability. And we really, as an input, had a single sequence. There was no other data, no other sort of um, repertoire or library that we had access to. So we literally were given a su single sequence and we rapidly iterated to, to design um, first exploratory rounds, just looking at different sequence location features um, with diverse mutations. We actually um, use both uh, substitutions as well as insertions also, also, or deletions, all sorts of diverse mutations on our platform um, to rapidly build uh, machine learning models of binding affinity. And you can see that as represented on the right, um, where we have a figure with the um, x-axis is the training data set size, uh, and the y-axis is the average um, screen correlation or relative ranking performance of a set of unseen sequences. 
Um, and so I know many many folks think that uh, machine learning is only successful when you have you know millions and millions of, of data points. And one of the things we really focus on on demonstrating at Big Hat is that um, you know you can make a very effective model that give you uh, sort of an effective direction towards uh, improved molecules, even with a very small number. So uh, you know with only 100 uh, data points, um, you have a very poor performing mo model. But even as you add 100 and 100 to get up to around 1,000 um, sequences, you can start getting to relatively high performing um, experiment correlation uh, that is relative ranking performance on unseen batches. Um, and so what this enables us to do is in really uh, rapid, uh, short order, uh, we can take these models that we've developed, again, from data, data generated entirely on our own platform. And we uh, were able to use these models to design multiple nanobody variants from the parental uh, that were 10x over the parental while maintaining thermal stability um, as we needed, and, and in this case, months ahead of our, our expected timeline. And so, you know, what I'm trying to show here is both not just um, that you don't need large amounts of data for making effective models, but also that a very rapid iteration you can get from a single sequence, right, to much more effective variants very quickly. Um, here's another example where um, we were able to use uh, a very small amount of data to improve developability properties. So as, as all of you know, thermal stability is a critical antibody property um, for developability. Um, and so we were actually um, trying to figure out how, how low, in many ways, um, uh, our data set size could be to start getting effective measurements. Of, is this actually going to be more thermostable or less, or should we worry about this variant or potentially not apply this variant? Uh, or design this variant because we'd be worried to compromise the thermal stability. So, um, you know, in the absence of uh, a large amount of training data, um, we developed a, a novel pre-training approach, which essentially means we can use structural simulators or in silico approaches to generate a very large number of, of um, labels or labels or, for example, estimated properties of these sequences. And we can pre-train uh, our models on those values. And then with only a hundred real thermal stability values from the lab, you can still get meaningful correlation. So on the top left here, I'm showing you what happens when you try to train a model on only 100 data points, um, 100 measured thermal stability values for a set of molecules. And you see almost no trend, right? It's a flat line. Um, if you use this pre-training approach where you can simulate an, an, an um, infinite number, uh, or at least uh, enough, in this case, uh, limited by compute, but a large number of, um, of uh, pre-trained, uh, or excuse me, of simulated labels, you actually can get a very, um, um, uh, hints of a first correlation when, when fine-tuning these on only 100 um, thermal stability values. So what this means is if you sort of bootstrap or resample the number of 100 data points you're um, training on versus testing on, uh, without any pre-training, you can get very little learning. So on the right here, we're seeing an average performance of these models around zero. But when you actually use the Big Hats pre-training scheme, what you're able to get is uh, now a meaningful correlation using only 100 real data points. So this, this need for, work, for um, working at a very low end is often applicable, especially, especially in the case of more complex assays, but also of starting a new campaigns. And so we're really able um, to develop a large number of, of machine learning approaches that allow us to learn with very small amount of data. And again, our goal is not to get models to be perfect. It's to be able to say, is this, model, is this variant going to be better or worse? And where should we, where should we be deploying um, kind of our design rounds to better improve those models. As another example here, we're showing a thermal stability optimization of a single parent where, um, you know, we like to say we really can optimize any objective that we can measure and if it's quantitative and, and that includes not just uh, affinity, but also thermal stability. So, um, you know, we've spent a lot of effort putting um, our, our platform towards improving the developability properties. And this is just a, a very simple example where you have a parental um, thermal melting curve, again, uh, sort of thermal ramp from zero to 90 C, um, looking at um, a molecule that you want to improve the thermal stability, but not um, change anything about the molecule's function. And so we basically generate, designed a, a plate of variants um, that were intended to diversify the thermal stability and show in just a single round here on the right, um, they were able to generate a wide diversity. So the parental thermal stability here is here in this dotted line. More stable molecules are, are above, less stable molecules are below. Um, and the um, mutation TM of some of the best molecules, this, in this case with an insertion, you are able to improve the thermal stability about 10 degrees without disrupting uh, the uh, molecular function, in this case, um, binding affinity as well as functional assay. So um, this is a great example of how even just with a very small number of mutants, you can well diversify and learn quite a bit about what mutants are affecting um, key developability properties. Uh, in the next case study, I want to show you how we actually designed a bispecific VHH that neutralizes um, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, in this case, this was now, I guess, about um, uh, well over a year ago when the pandemic was first uh, beginning, and so was Big Hat, actually. Um, we onboarded a series of um, VHHs and SEFEs, in the beginning, those targeting um, uh, SARS-CoV-1. 
and later those that targeted SARS-CoV-2 after those became more available. And we basically deployed the Big App platform to see if we could improve not just the affinity, but actually um, sort of the, the, the function, ultimately the neutralization of these antibodies. So in, in a matter of four rounds, um, we took a starter molecule um, that um, in this case actually was a SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-1 binder, which we then wanted to optimize for SARS-CoV-2. In four rounds, we improved the affinity um, two orders of magnitude, about 100x. Um, and uh, we were able to source several other molecules that we followed the same procedure. So very rapid iteration and improvement of affinity. In a single step, we were able to take this molecule you see on the left, that was optimized on the left, and pair that with several other molecules to find an optimal bispecific formatting. So you can see here in the figure a series of, of VHHs that we um, uh, paired with uh, the first VHH, um, and several, uh, and several actually increased by an order of magnitude the overall um, uh, affinity. And then, um, after some op further optimization, which I'll describe in the next slide, we actually were able to see the uh, relative um, uh, neutralization. So, when we put these two together, when we further optimized um, the the linker, uh, the, the second um, VHH um, head. You can see the first VHH head, the neutralization is shown in the um, filled in circles here. Um, the second, the um, empty circles here. And then there's quite a bit of synergistic um, inhibition of viral invasion. And so this is pretty exciting for us because this was really a matter of months on our platform um, just after we've begun, very, begun the company and, and were able to get um, quite, um, I would say, potent live neutralization from this by specific. And one of the added benefits of, of the platform that we like to think about is we can optimize really really any component or any sequence. So um, I showed you previously on, as on the left how we optimized the, and discovered the best pair of, of nanobodies. We also looked at linker length. And this was basically one step on the platform. We designed a series of linkers, short, medium, um, long. Uh, we were able to find that uh, sort of medium-sized linker was, was in many ways optimal. We tested the rigidity or flexibility of different link linkers. And all this was, was done in, in very short order. And what that um, wrapped up together uh, into was uh, essentially um, our development of uh, uh, neutralizing SARS-CoV-2 antibody, starting with some sequences, as I mentioned, from SARS-CoV-1, then SARS-CoV-2 as, avail as available, um, of all components of that bispecific. And ultimately, this um, resulted in a best-in-class potency against SARS-CoV-2. I'm showing here our, our measured uh, live virus neutralization um, compared to some of the other um, uh, players out there uh, that have been um, uh, also, also broadcast. And um, one of the nicest things about this um, case study, which I, I want to emphasize, is that you know, in many ways, um, a lot of standard approaches sort of rely on just binding affinity. But one of the things that we do, because of the way we forward design molecules or design them in a fit-for-purpose way, is we can actually design for any objective. So in one of the optimization pieces here, we actually switched out binding affinity for then competitive uh, binding to get closer and closer to and the actual function that we needed. And so we can regularly do this, which is that we want to start by optimizing for one, one um, property and can uh, seamlessly during a campaign change what we optimize to make it harder to get more granularity between variants, et cetera. Um, in the next case study, uh, I'll show you how we actually optimize not just for protein, but also for DNA sequences. So this was work as part of our NIST SBIR grant where we wanted to um, optimize the DNA construct for um, expression of GFP with the idea of optimizing uh, yield in our cell-free production systems. So we focused on optimizing the 30 base pair region from the RBS through the first five codons um, of this uh, DNA construct. And, and even in this smaller, more tractable space, it's still experimentally intractable to fully sample the space um, for, for yield optimization. So in silico, first, we developed a series of active learning methods. Um, again, active learning methods are uh, machine learning methods that allow broad exploration of a, of a complex sequence space. Um, and we gave them a very simple test, which is to withhold the, Scheindel, the highly conserved Scheindel Garner motif um, and then simulate how quickly they could discover that motif as a, a well-proven um, well um, motif for, for production. Uh, and we ended up then uh, further optimizing other properties. Um, the, for example, um, distance between the Shine Delgado motif as from the start codon, uh, as well as other sequence based properties. And so in only five cycles, um, we were able to optimize for improved, statistically significantly improved yield um, in our cell free system. And so um, this uh, set, or at least a progression of the optimization is shown on the, on the bottom right here, um, where every dot here is a, an overall. Uh, a different design of this DNA construct um, with the overall yield on the, uh, on the um, y-axis. And so it really was sort of four and five rounds uh, that took us to, again, uh, statistically, uh, statistically improved yield. And, and we discovered along the way, I think, properties that are uh, well appreciated in many ways, highly AT-rich linker motifs and, and, and certain spacing constraints. This is actually one of the first things we did as part of this NIST grant. And again, with a goal of developing not just a, a high-yield construct, but also methodologies, right, that 
can be um, generally generalized to um, other other problems that we're working on at BigHub. And the last example I'll show is um, now actually not optimizing antibodies, but optimizing fluorescent proteins. So um, we developed a series of methods to optimize the spectra of fluorescent proteins. Um, we have a fantastic collaboration with one of the leading active learning labs at NYU, uh, Andrew Gordon Wilson's group. And um, with, in collaboration with that group, we developed a, a series of uh, methodologies that could explore um, what mutations to fluorescent protein would improve the stoke shift. Um, the goal of this optimization was to take a fluorescent protein and to broaden the gap, basically this um, gap here between the emission and the excitation um, uh, peaks or spectrum. And so um, for those of you who are um, more familiar with the uh, machine learning world, we developed a series of CNN deep ensembles that um, were able to give us sort of well-calibrated uncertainties of which variants we think would be better versus which would be worse. Um, after in evaluating those methods in silica, we applied those over many rounds to optimize these fluorescent proteins um, and were able to generate about several dozen, uh, it was about actually 40 uh, molecules of improved stoke shift. Um, we've now extended this, uh, extended this collaboration are now uh, working on kind of the more multi-objective problem, which is that uh, sometimes when you improve the properties uh, such as stoke shift, you may decrease other valuable properties such as brightness and um, or, or stability. And so, you know, this is the same problem we see in antibodies. And again, what I'm showing are methods that we've developed that are broadly um, useful for other programs um, that we have ongoing at BigCap. So this is a great example of how we're able to develop these methods and use them to propose um, novel mutations to these proteins that improve multiple properties. And the same methods are now being applied, as I mentioned, to, to many of our ongoing programs um, at Big Hat. So I hope with that I gave you a good sense of the way that our platform works. Again, the goal for us is to enable very rapid iteration between um, uh, in silico design um, to validation in the lab and to turn that crank really as quickly as possible to tackle pretty complex challenges uh, in engineering these next generation antibodies as well as other proteins. And so we have a fantastic team that is um, uh, working together to pursue this vision. Um, the leadership team here is repre represented on the left. We have an uh, incredibly uh, inter uh, team uh, uh, across many disciplines um, represented here, wonderful investors and advisors, and, and we are, are hiring. If anyone is interested, please do reach out. And um, with that, I would uh, love if there are any questions to, to take them. Thank you, Peyton. This was a fantastic talk. Um, my question in particular around the optimization strategies that you have uh, applied to your antibodies, um, how far away did you mutate them in the process and, and how much of these mutations are also seen in, uh, in human individuals? So a lot of like machine learning approaches in the early days went very far away from what we would consider a human antibody. So that, you know, very, very pointed question, how far away from human did you go? That's a great question. So because we actually work mostly on nanobodies, I guess the answer is <laughs> you're from Canada. Um, so the, uh, you know, the short answer is we, we've campaigned where we have, for example, proposed mutations that are one or two mutations away. Those were not to achieve our design goals. Um, in other cases, we, we've uh, designed the molecules that are um, actually sort of five to seven, and in some cases, even up to 10 mutations away. I think, you know, I, I guess I would make the argument that, you know, some, you're right, sometimes you can get quite away from the parental, but our goal is actually to measure essentially all the things we would care about. So for example, if you're worried about, um, you know, making, for example, your antibody too sticky, or there are other properties that you care about, um, that you're worried more mutations would actually cause more problems in, our goal or philosophy as a company is to figure out how to measure what we can as much as possible. Um, kind of, again, in this very fast, close loop setting. And so, you know, the beauty of the platform is it's unconstrained. You can propose any mutation, any different framework, CDR, insertion, et cetera. Uh, in reality, we often, you know, I think for many reasons, to do try to keep the um, sort of search space uh, or the mutations proposed, uh, you know, so attractive. There's no reason to go farther away than you. But sometimes you can get to actually um, quite, uh, I'd say, uh, optimize or, or more optimal sequences in the part that you do. So, really, the trade off makes up on the individual campaign and the fitness landscape of the particular model that you're working Thank you, Pete. We have another question on the left side. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could describe the cell-free uh, production a little bit more and if that involves glycosylation or not. Yeah, great question. So this is actually um, one of the other reasons um, that we particularly like the, the uh, extra format. So we mostly focus right now on, on antibodies that do not require glycosylation. That's all by bonding to other um, post-translational modifications are, are um, much easier, much more trackable. People are developing you know, cell-free mixtures that do enable by constellations, those are, I think, less less common and, and less, um, I would say, easy to scale, at least in sort of an industrial scale moment. So right now, we do focus on those without by constellations. We have cell-based production in-house as well, for when we do need, um, for example, uh, by constellation or other 
um, uh, I would say, other formats that are less easy to celebrate. And we actually trade back and forth between those. For example, for speed of design and optimization for other biophysics versus for uh, a larger scale later fashion. Great question. I'd love to see more people in the celebrate space. I think we're starting to see a lot more people uh, starting to work uh, work in that area. I think it's quite promising. I think these will start becoming, um, I would say, uh, more developed areas of, of both development as, as well as kind of production scale, um, or, or at least production. Do you publish? Do we publish? Yes, actually, the last, um, uh, let's see. Uh, slide that I showed, we actually do have an ICML um, cop bio paper where we are describing some of the methodologies used here and actually have several other publications in, in uh, preparation. So yes, it's very much our attention and um, we already have one you can take a look at that's linked here. Uh, for the examples where there, the training was on 100 or 200 or 300 mutants, uh, do you perform any predictions about positions or, you know, positions not mutated or alternative amino acids at a position that weren't sampled? Or is it, um, is the question how to combine the mutations where you have observed data? That is to say, is there any mechanism to provide predictions about, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of mutations and a lot of amino acids that haven't been tested when you look at 200 mutants. How, do, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is actually, and what you've done in many ways, whatever you are in, in that kind of, I would say, machine learning world, right, what, what really matters, I think what you're asking is, how is the test that constructed, right? Where, where can I actually start gaining um, some predictive power? For example, if you have a bunch of mutations in, in CDR3 in your test set, it may be hard, for example, much harder to generalize, for example, those same mutations in CDR2 or 1 versus, for example, combinations of those. So um, we actually put a lot, a lot of effort into that, and often most of our prediction challenges are have multiple test sets of different difficulties. Um, in that particular figure, what we were showing were uh, combinations of mutations that have already been seen. So uh, combinations of mutants as well as different residues of the same position that have been seen. Um, however, obviously the performance uh, changes based on how you're evaluating that and how that would test them. How does it know? Does that answer your question? I guess, yeah, so it's combinations of things that they're seen. How does it, how do you inform a model to predict amino acids that were not evident in the test set? Like, is it a, Durishly a mixture density, or like how is, how is it able to know about a universe of mutations not present? How do you how do you inform the model to do that? So this is, this is exactly why we use a lot of active learning, because there's no real way to know, right? That's gonna be entirely an uncertainty. So the, the way, you know, especially a lot of these um, spatial optimization techniques that we use work is that you have basically only, I would say, certainty around mutations you've tested. The meaning your model is uncertain about everything. It knows nothing, like truly nothing. It's uncertain. And so basically you kind of use those areas of uncertainty. You kind of have a, a kernel function if you're familiar with that. So, how uncertain am I about a certain mutation in a certain position based on what I know? And in the beginning, again, like uncertainty dwarfs everything. But you sort of sample effectively, right? Where you do have that uncertainty, you quickly sort of fit um, what your prediction is, uh, for example, that position, um, sort of that structural feature, that residue. Um, and then you're, you're quickly, through rapid iteration, trying to basically clamp down that uncertainty, build a model of things you think might be useful. So you may focus in on a particular area, like a very specific um, location in a given CDR where you're looking at different combinations of, of similar residues, et cetera. Um, but the, the short answer is that um, we do this a lot through sort of really complex um, kernel functions of how we will project our, our certainty or knowledge about us, a particular um, mutation based on what we already know. And in the beginning, it's all uncertainty, as you said. You know very, very little, and the whole point is to iterate very quickly to um, kind of cut down on uncertainty and to give some predictive power um, in areas where previously you didn't know much. Thank Does you. that answer your question? I, I'm sure I have many more, but yes, thank you. And there's, there's another question over here. Thank you. Yeah, so a quick question about your bispecific antibody against SARS-2. And so have you ever considered to use your technology to design molecules uh, to prevent or be effective against uh, escape mutations? That is a great question. Actually, uh, you know, I actually thought about putting a slide here about this. So we actually, uh, after that, that was actually a proper principle for us. We had just found it and then we just started. And, uh, you know, it was not sort of our original focus. And actually, in some ways, like a technology development program. We actually are now um, working on a pan-viral uh, neutralizer, and so that is something that we think that our platform could be very effective at. Um, we can we can rapidly iterate, iterate um, over you know very small time frame um, to generate molecules that we think can be uh, quite impactful. So that is something that we are thinking about internally. Thank you for listening. If you want to learn more about Big Hat and what we're working on, please visit our website at bighatbio.com, and you can also check out our job postings on the same website. Thanks.